Why happiness needs God. As you know, I became a Catholic while I was teaching in a Baptist college in Atlanta, Georgia, Mercer University. And that was about 1984. In 1989, I would go to Fordham University to teach Thomas Aquinas on the philosophy faculty. After teaching myself Thomas, never having had a course in St. Thomas, never having attended a Catholic school, and I was really excited, thrilled, the prospect of going to a Catholic institution, an old one, in a, ca in a Catholic part of the United States because my experience of Catholicism and I had all been Catholicism in the New South. And so I thought that I had, and I knew I had a great deal to learn about the church, about the church as it had grown up in this country. When I went to Fordham in the fall of 1989, I was hit in the face with something that I just didn't expect. And that is how little students knew about their faith. I remember once in the very first introductory philosophy classes I had, I, I made an allusion to the prodigal son. And I saw them on the faces of my 35 students that they didn't know what the prodigal son was. They had never heard of it. And so I had them hold up their hands. Uh, has anybody ever heard of this? And two people out of 35 had heard of it. And then I had them hold up their hands. Well, who attended Catholic high schools? And just about everybody in the class held up their hands. The two people that knew who the, who the prodigal son was had not gone to Catholic high schools. <laughs> Now, and I used to do this all the time, I would randomly test my freshmen on their knowledge of the faith and find they knew almost nothing. And this, these are students that had gone through Catholic schools from kindergarten through high school. I have no idea what was being taught to them about religion, except they knew an awful lot about liberal political policy. Another thing that shocked me, I was always getting questions about, well, what do I have to do to be a good Catholic? I mean, what, what's the minimum I need to do to be saved uh, and to go to heaven? It sounds like that story of the uh, rich young ruler, right? What, you know, what must I do, Lord, to be saved? And I kept getting this over and over from my students. And I began to probe why they took this approach of how little do I need to do. And I realized that all they had been taught about the faith was that they were supposed to follow rules. They had never been taught the idea that growing in the faith was growing in the virtues. They had never been taught that the aim of the Christian life is to embody faith, hope, and love, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, the seven virtues. To become a certain kind of person as opposed to someone who successfully gets through life without breaking the Ten Commandments or breaking some thou shalt nots. And as I, as I talked to them, I realized they had what I would call a minimalistic approach to living the Catholic faith. Because they had been taught that all you need to do is follow some rules, and of course if you break them you go to confession and then you start over again, right? And hopefully when you die, you won't die with a broken rule on your, on your conscience. That the idea of happiness was a great teaching tool for them. Because happiness represents a lifetime of growing in the virtues, a lifetime of reaching towards sanctity yourself. You know, the, 
you probably, you've never heard of him, but there's a wonderful quote from a French writer named Léon Bois, who sp spelled B-L-O-Y, who was one of the giants of French Catholic thought. He is to France what Chesterton or Belloc is to English Catholicism. He said, the only sadness there is in life is not to be a saint. That's the only true sadness. Yet, these students didn't have this vision of the Catholic life. They didn't have a vision that the work of the Catholic Christian life is your life. That's the work. The work you face is you. I think, who is it that keeps saying the problem is us and wants to discuss it at night? That's right. The problem is you. Now, the best way I can illustrate the difference and the ramifications of a kind of rule approach to a virtue approach is this. Uh, when I was growing up in the 50s and the early 60s, my mother would always say to me, you've got to be a virgin when you get married. And she just, that was big on her list. And she would, con so that was a rule. But yet, in my home, there was a great deal of yelling and screaming, a great deal of, of high drama. And so, I felt like I was between this world of, you've got to be a virgin when you get married, but what do you need? You need temperance, you need calmness, you need to be able to control your emotions, right? But I wasn't exactly getting the model of controlling emotions <laughs> as I was growing up. So I was being asked to follow a rule, but I wasn't being formed in the virtue that would enable me to keep the rule. And I think you can multiply those examples over and over again. Parents saying, you got to do this and you got to do that, but they're not embodying the habits of character that enable you, when you get to that hurdle, to jump over it. So if you want your kids to be temperate in their actions, you've got to model so they will learn it. There, leadership in, in morality and politics trumps anything that can be said anything that can be written. People change when they have leadership. You can publish all the great books in the world, all the great encyclicals, you can reprint the complete Chesterton, but unless you've got saints and heroes leading you, the society and the individuals in it will suffer. So why happiness needs God? Why happiness needs God? Why happiness, happiness requires virtue? It's because it's through virtue that we unite ourselves to God. Why do we need to unite ourselves to God? Because we have infinite desire. And this, this is the really interesting thing about this group of people here. You know, I'm trying to get around to talk to everybody just a little bit this week, talk to a lot of you, and many of you in one way or another have kidded me about being a scholar, <laughs> about having written a book that's so hard to read, and you've kidded all of us who are on the faculty. But you know, you've got infinite desire too. So happiness is just as much of a problem for you as it is for me. I mean, I just have happened to have the privilege to think about it for a while before I really went to work. And you, 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 all of you have within your, yourself something you, there's no off switch. There's no... Uh, faucet to turn off. It's wide open and it's streaming through you from the moment you're born. A baby cries, expressing infinite desire. 
a baby goes to the breast of his or her mother. Infinite desire. Augustine saw that in the Confessions. People do wild, awful things. They sin. Infinite desire. See, we wouldn't have the spectacle of sin in human history that we have without infinite desire. You know, you often find tree huggers, and I'm sure there's some in the audience, so I apologize for saying it. I mean, I'm in Wyoming, right? You often find, you often find, uh, you often find tree huggers talking about how great animals are compared to humans. Let me say I have, I actually had students in my class at Fordham who said that they would first personally give their life to save a species of animal. That they thought that was a, that was a good way to, sac you know, to sacrifice their life. Because animals were more valuable, more important, more good than people. Why is it that human beings can do such atrocious things? I mean, they kill out of just meanness. They kill out of hatred. Animals don't do that. Yeah. Well, later. <laughs> I don't want to be corrected by people who live out of doors, please. <laughs> no. Generally speaking. I mean, I mean, in the 20th century, more human beings were killed by genocide than in any century in human history. The modern age, we've grown up, we've progressed, we've become, we're so much better than those medievals. I used to give an F to any student who uttered the phrase dark ages. Dark ages don't exist, they were the ages of light, the ages of faith, the ages of light coming through Gothic windows, Romanesque windows, the ages of chant and polyphony, the age of Dante, age of reason. The dark, if there was a dark ages, it was the 20th century, the century of Mao and Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot. That was the Dark Ages. But why, how do we explain this evil? Baudelaire, Charles Baudelaire, the, great, the greatest Catholic poet of the 20th century, as Eliot called him, T.S. Eliot, wrote his poems in a volume called The Flowers of Evil. And if you read through those poems, it's clear that Baudelaire is a Catholic is seeing that, that this spectacle of evil is a product of a mistaken attempt to find happiness. But you see, mistakes about happiness are not innocuous. You know, they're not any small matter. Mistakes about happiness lead to hell. I, I understand you got a great talk on hell today from a man who knows all about it. <laughs> Mistakes about happiness lead to death. I mean, I was telling some of, the, some of you last night about my, my adopted son, Cyprian. We call him Chippy. And how in these Romanian orphanages, they keep kids in cribs all the time. They never take them out except to eat and go to the bathroom. So our son was in an orphanage for three years and was never taken out of a bed except couple of times a day. Because of that, he has institutionally called, caused autism. Now, do the people running these places understand human happiness, infinite desire, and what, what is required of a child? You treat him like they're in a zoo. Bet not even as good as a zoo. So, You can't avoid grappling with this subject. You can't avoid deciding every day what you do with this inward push. It's, it's as if we're all ADD on happiness. And we have to do something with it. Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, if we have an infinite desire, it means that only something infinite can satisfy it. As Dr. Carlson has been teaching Augustine, who wrote the most famous phrase of all, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. Happiness needs God because the desire for happiness is infinite and God is the only infinite being in existence. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, we're going to go through some questions that raise that expose the complexity of that problem. Because it's complex because he is unseen. God is out of sight. It's complex because we live in a world that is not infinite, that is finite. And that we need finite things to live. If if we put it this way, if God alone is necessary for happiness, why seek anything else? Why marry and beget children? That's not God. Why work? Why not just live at the most minimum level of human sustenance. Why not live like a monk? Live like the, uh, the, po the fathers up in the trees. Do we have monks here? You see, that's the point. We're gonna, by the time we're through tonight, we're gonna understand why monk happiness is okay. You know? You know, why worry about Michelangelo's David? Why go to Florence to go to the Uffizi? Why? If we just need God, why do we worry about great music or even philosophy? Why do we worry about getting an education? Why aren't we just all radical God seekers and just cut out everything else? There is there's a technical way of referring to this. I'll just throw it out there. I, don't ex I only throw it out there for you to have a kind of language for what we're talking about. Is happiness about simply a single end? Or is it about an inclusive end? In other words, is it God plus? other things, or is it simply God alone? I find that when I, for example, speak to really earnest Christians, and I know we got a few here, we got a handful, because we've got some evangelicals in the room, they will challenge me by saying, you know, happiness is only about your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you love him and he loves you, you're happy and nothing else matters. But then we're, we as Catholics look back at this tradition we've all been talking about the last few days. Aristotle, Plato, Aqu uh, Augustine, Aquinas, who talk about other things that are necessary to happiness, like healthy body and food and shelter and wisdom and contemplation, first principles, philosophy, friendship. I mean, friendship might be the best example because many of you might think, well, con that contemplation thing's not for me. But would you deny that friendship? is a part of your happiness? Would you deny that family is a part of your happiness? Because all those things come under this God and whatever. 
Well, how do you solve that? I mean, if happiness is in God and God alone, how can you understand that anything else need to be added to it? And if nothing else needs to be added to it, then what are we doing with all these other things in our lives? Just don't, don't they become just unnecessary and extraneous? And don't they become idols? Don't they become obstacles to loving God alone? And this is where the Catholic tradition, the Catholic humanistic tradition, and I hope all of you are over this prejudice against the word humanism. Humanism, properly speaking, is a good thing. That's what Carlson is doing here, is Catholic Christian humanism. It's a good thing, because it's God-centered. The original humanism was God-centered, okay? We have a tradition which teaches that grace perfects nature, it does not destroy it. I want everybody to write that down. Grace perfects nature, it does not destroy it. I don't know how many times that phrase is found in Aquinas, probably hundreds. Which means that nothing in nature that, that God put in nature is in vain. Meaning, nothing that is nature will go unsatisfied. Everything is available to what God made, to what desire God put in His being. Avail Satisfaction is available. You know, the famous play by Samuel Beckett called Waiting for Godot. How many of you have ever heard of that play, Waiting for Godot? How many of you have ever heard of Samuel Beckett? How many of you don't want to hear this story? No, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, what about if we go to Greek mythology and the, the, the story of Tantalus? And the story, and the story of Tantalus, the, uh, the Greek uh, figure who, uh, I forget exactly how it was, but something kept being uh, put just out of the reach of his hand. And just when he was about to grab it, it would be taken away from him. And he spent his whole life... Uh, trying to reach out it was taken away. Or the myth of Sisyphus, the figure who pushes the rock up the hill only for it to roll back down. There's never satisfaction. There's always another frustration. In waiting for Godot, two bums stand on an empty stage with a tree waiting for God. The whole play, but he never comes. They, they think he's going to come. They talk about him for two or three hours but he never comes. See, in, in those existential depictions of life, nature is in vain. Nature, we have desires that can't be satisfied in this world because the world is unfriendly to our desires. The world is alien. Human beings are not created in a providential, ordered cosmos. So how does this solve our problem of the single end and the inclusive end? We can look at nature, human nature, and we can see the things that we need to live well, and we can be confident that if we virtuous, virtuously strive to gain these things, that it's part of our happiness. As we strive to be educated, our minds desire to know. That's a desire that God wants us to satisfy, because he gave it to us. At the highest level, God wants us to contemplate truth and to know wisdom. God gave us bodies. He wants us to take care of them, to feed them properly, to exercise them properly, to play golf whenever you can. <laughs> God, you talk about leisure, part of, the, part of the importance of leisure is that it gives your body a break. It's not just about your mind. It's that your body needs a break too because you think in a body. You're not angels. You're not angels. Even though you may suffer from angelism, 
which is the belief that you think you're just an angel, angel captured in a body. I hope that nobody here thinks when you die you become an angel. You don't think that, do you? If, if you do, you're a heretic. <laughs> We're gonna burn you after dinner over cigars. <laughs> so nature is gonna have a cigar bonfire. We're gonna burn that mountain guy right there. <laughs> the bear didn't get him, we'll get him. So we, by looking at the tradition that informs the Catholic wisdom can come to the conclusion that yes, we believe in an inclusive idea of a happy life that includes the goods of the mind, the goods of the body, the things that human nature require to live well and to not die and to not be ignorant, and to not be evil, and to not be stupid. Because God didn't give us desire so that we wouldn't ful fulfill the potential that is implicit in that desire. But, someone might say, well, who are the best examples within the Catholic Church of happy people? And ob the obvious answer would be the saints. Now, have you ever thought of looking at the saints that you know in terms of examples of happy lives? And I've done that. I mean, I'm known that we're near uh, up to speed with knowledge of vast array of saints in the Catholic Church that I should be. I'll get there one day. I got my butler's lies of the saints ready to go. <laughs> but when I look at just the saints I care about, there is no one type of happy life there. There is no st strict little model. You gotta be like this one. One reason I became a Catholic was that I saw this incredible diversity in the best sense. Meaning I, Deal Hudson, as weird and wacky as I am, could be in the Catholic Church and pursue the things that I love. And that the church would consider that a valuable thing to do. The church would consider my interest in philosophy, my interest in the arts, my interest now in politics, it's a good thing. And I don't have to be just a Bible scholar. I didn't feel like it was my calling to be a Bible scholar. <clears throat> if you look at the diversity of saints, now the ones I care about the most, Aquinas ate a lot. <laughs> wrote a lot. Thomas More, the great, one of the greatest Renaissance humanists, wore a hair shirt. <laughs> but he was not just a philosopher and a teacher and a translator. He was a politician. The court of Henry VIII. A man that knew the danger of political intrigue and knew the art of diplomacy. St. Francis. Welcome, Brother Fire, as they put a hot, burning piece of iron in his eye to cure eye disease. But the interesting thing about St. Francis is that he was a hellraiser as a kid. He dropped his clothes off and walked out of town. <laughs> yeah, that's happiness. <laughs> St. John Vianney, I'm so glad that you talked about that a few days ago. I've been fa I'm fascinated by the power of the great confessor, the, ma the man that can see into souls instantly. I met somebody like that once. It's really scary. <laughs> and I've heard, I've heard stories from people who have 
met with, with saints like that. And St. John Vianney didn't do well in school. Not intellectual at all. Not a scholar at all. Could care less. And he, used the whip. he used the whip. There you go. But yet, he had this tremendous gift and he killed himself by serving his people in the confessional. He wasn't Thomas More, man of the world. He wasn't Thomas Aquinas, the greatest scholar of Christendom. He wasn't St. Francis, the, the nature mystic. And he wasn't St. Philip Neri, the, great, the greatest comic among the saints, the saint of laughter, practical jokes, the saint who, who just created the, or, the form called the oratorio in music. And, it, and, of course, created the oratorians. He wasn't like St. Therese de Lisieux, the little flower, who is probably the most important saint on the subject of happiness. If you read her, if you're going to read any saint on the subject of happiness, you should lead, read St. Therese because of her understanding of what I'm going to call nuptial happiness. Now, why do we have such diversity of saints and diversity of saints' happy lives? I think it's because of what we're seeing right here. It's that all happiness begins with God. And what you add to it, according to your nature, your human nature, is never going to be uniform. In other words, my happy life isn't going to be like your happy life specifically, or your happy life. What we will have in common is a unity with God. But when we get down to the level of how we pursue goods of the mind or goods of the body or goods of friendship, there's going to be great diversity. So happy lives are not identical. Now, interesting, remember the first line of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina? It's this much debated line since he wrote it. He said, happy families are all alike, but unhappy families are different each in their own way. Which means something very simple. That if you look at happy lives, there is a general pattern that is similar. And there it is. They're united to the true end of infinite desire, God. And they will pursue the satisfaction of their human nature in virtuous ways. But you know, within that there's going to be great diversity, as we see in the lives of the saints. Nuptial happiness. The happiness of the unity between the soul and God. The marriage. This is what leads us to see what I want to call the option. Because I've been, I've been struggling with how to describe to you how we see monk happiness <laughs> as being just as valid as the happiness of St. Thomas More, who was the, the active, political, philosophical, family man, bon vivant, great high culture. When we compare his life with the life of, some, of a monk who lives in the top of a palm tree, and does nothing but eat dates and drink wa just enough water to survive, but yes, has this amazing relationship with God. How can we possibly say one is happy and the other is happy? How can we say that Stuart can be as happy as I can be? I mean, Stuart's not going to from, go from here and read Aristotle. Or maybe he is. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the monk's cave 
What if he decides to live the rest of his life flagellating himself, suffering in order to unite, unite himself with God? That is an option the Catholic tradition has always taught. It's called the difference between the contemplative life and the active life. And this, is, this I think, solves our problem. Throughout the Catholic tradition, every theologian, every spiritual writer has distinguished between different kinds of callings. These callings lead to different forms of happy lives. That's why Stuart's form is going to be different from my form is different from our clergy's form and our sister's form. Generally speaking, we divide them between contemplation and action. Meaning, at some point in your life, you either decided consciously or unconsciously to live an active life in the world. You decided to live in the world of work, in the world of family, in the world of community. And when you do that, you don't have a lot of time for contemplation. You may try to make time for leisure, but it's always a struggle. There are those, some are priests, some are religious, some are scholars, some are monks who decide to seek the way of contemplation. When they do that, they are seeking to minimize this God plus. They're trying to minimize what goes in the plus side. They're going to put away as many finite things as possible. They're going to eat less. They're going to party less. They are maybe not going to have families. They're not going to worry about making money. If you look at, if you look at the Benedictine rule, if you looked at the great tradition of Benedictine monasteries, you see lives laid out in ways to have the very little but essentials for life. That is a part of the glory of the Catholic tradition that at that is encouraged, celebrated as an option. Now, the tradition also argues that's superior. It's superior. The contemplative option is superior to the active option. Now, a lot of people say, Vatican II did away with that. Vatican II didn't do away with any, half of the stuff people tell you is it, sent away. I uh, recently taught a class on the real meaning of Vatican II, to, and I, I would read passages from the documents of Vatican II like, bishops should strive for the liturgy in their diocese to retain as much of the Latin as possible so that the faithful will remember the original liturgy. There was a, a story in the New York Times about a week ago of a parish in New Jersey where Father Paracone, the uh, head of Christophidelis, went was assigned to that parish re recently and he started using a lot of the Latin in the in liturgy and there were signs out front, don't roll back Vatican II. When we look at the document on liturgy in Vatican II, it specifically says, use Latin. It also says that all priests should have at least two years of philosophy. It also said all priests should learn Latin. What happened to Vatican II? How many of you have read the 16 documents of Vatican II? They're really good. In, in my journey into the church, I started 
hearing so much bad, th bad stuff about Vatican II, that Vatican II has made the church Protestant, that Vatican II was going to undermine the great Thomistic tradition and so forth. I went and read the documents of Vatican II and found I couldn't see any difference between them and the tradition of Augustine and Aquinas and Newman that I had learned the faith from. Oh, if we were the Church of Vatican II, the real Church of Vatican II. In fact, what? So where did it come from? Where is well, I'll tell you. John Paul II, it can be said, has been the Pope of the, Pope of the real Vatican II. Where it came from is very simple. The media got a hold of the event of Vatican II and created an image in the press of Vatican II that, sat, that was the instrument of liberals and anti-Catholics that were controlling it. Unfortunately, some one member of the Jesuit order was in Rome and was writing some of those stories that were published in the New Yorker magazine that were beautifully written and very informative but set up the drama of Vatican II in a way that represented the cause of liberal reform. Now, was it Xavier Wren? Xavier Wren, yes. Now, why is contemplation considered a, a higher form of life than, act, than active? For simple reason, that contemplation makes your marriage to God in this life, your effective union with God in this life, more intimate. It's, it's, it's a simple, it's simply explained. I, I think you were, Mark, you were saying in the discussion last night, you were saying, you know, why do these wives leave their husbands? Because the husbands never pay any attention to them. They're not close to them. Contemplatives s spend a lot of time with God. They spend a lot of time in the presence of the person, Margaret, who is God. I mean, God's a person. We're a person. You talk to him. You pray to him. You sing to him. You sit in his presence silently. Contem the, the greatness of the contemplative life is that you're there with him more and more intensely. Now, people argue that the active life, the doing of good works... The Martha role. People always think Martha gets, gets you know, bad press. No, Martha's not getting bad press. Martha is getting credit for what she's doing. But as Jesus says, she's not doing the best thing. We all, in this, in this time in history, recoil at the political incorrectness of saying that a certain form of life is intrinsically better than another form of life. Because most of us in this room are very active. Carlson and the rest of us are urging you to cut out some leisure. Why? So you can spend time with the end of your infinite desire. Take care of that hose in, the, in your soul that you can't turn off. Because if you don't spend time with it, if you don't spend time with the person that that desire is for, you're going to end up doing things with it that are destructive. Doing things with it that hurt you, that hurt others, and that hurt God. Infinite desire is something that undergirds even what we do to benefit our bodies, to benefit, to benefit our families, but it cannot end there. 
In other words, man is not enough. What that means is this. that the, In the history of happiness as we put on the board the very first day, the struggle between the philosophers and the, the theologians, between the psychologists and the Christians all along has been this. Whether or not we were going to make man the end of our desire for happiness, or are we going to make God the end of our desire for happiness? What we see in the, the contemporary idol of psychological happiness is that we have once again made man the end object of our infinite desire, which means we have made man an idol, which means we are hurting man. But what part of man have we made the idol? What part? We have made his feelings. We have made, the, we have made his feeling states, his psychological states, the most important thing in man. The Greeks would laugh at us. The Renaissance philo philosophers would laugh at us. The Enlightenment philosophers would laugh at us because at least they knew what the glory of man was, his reason, his love, his will, his imagination. So in, in elevating man, we have devoted him, we have demoted him to the lowest level. We have really created, in our time, man the animal. So what we've seen in these first three lectures, I'll summarize in this way. We have seen that happiness is presently living a double life. The double life of happiness. The first life is the life that it takes from its ancient roots the roots where to call somebody happy was to say someone was living morally the best life that could be lived through the virtues. The second part of the life is that we are, we are now calling things happy when they feel good to us, when they give us contentment or satisfaction. But yet we, we're using the word happy with its ancient weight, with its ancient importance, with, it, with its ancient value. And so in doing that, we are sending ourselves in the wrong direction because we are giving ultimacy to things that we should have second, third, or fourth down the list in importance. Each lecture I've ended with a quote from Aquinas. Tonight's quote is as following. All things which man desires, he necessarily desires for an ultimate end. Thank you very much.